Hi there, and welcome to How to Choose Happiness. I'm your host, Lauren G. Foster, and it's a beautiful, sunny, and cold Thursday afternoon in December of 2019. Our, um, the people who come after us centuries from now may look at these and think that we're just so primitive, but so these are the kinds of things that pop through my head. So, welcome, welcome. This month, we're talking about the power of words. So, we started out last week um, with the topic, be, impe be impeccable with your word, from the work of Don Miguel Ruiz in his book, The Four Agreements. And we talked about how words are magic. Hello, Tammy. Thank you so much for being here. And Tammy's with us, keeping up to date and adding things that I may have forgotten um, keeping us connected in all kinds of ways. And this is Romeo. Romeo likes to be on TV. Um, so last week we talked about being impeccable with your word and how words can be, uh, or how words are magic spells, and they can either be white magic or black magic, and that we are sowing seeds with every word that we speak, and how we get to choose the kinds of seeds that we sow, and also the kind of fertile ground that we choose to have within our own heart and soul and mind and what seeds will allow to grow and so that, that's a beautiful subject in a beautiful book that there is a link to um, and then this week we're talking about the worthiness of words on Tuesday we introduced the four-way test the be happy first version which is to ask yourself four questions about the words that you speak before you choose to put them out into the world. And those four questions are, is it true? Is it kind? Is it useful? And does it improve upon the silence? So today I just want to share some fun stories with you. I'm actually going to read some things to you that are that are fun, but that are demonstrative of the, the power of words and how the, the impact that they can have when they're used incorrectly or translated incorrectly, that can wind up often to be very humorous. Um, and how it is so very important to step back and understand the intent behind words. We can tell if someone is being malicious, even if we can't understand a single word of their language. And in the same way, we can understand when people are being kind and loving and generous even if we don't understand the words. Now of course there are other cultural differences and even a tone of voice or a facial expression might mean something different in a different culture but for the most part we connect as humans. We through the energy that connects us all through scientific um, means such as the so-called mirror neuron that we have that causes us to mimic one another's behavior, we can get a sense of what the meaning is if we take the time to look for it. So let me share with you some of the fun things that I kind of looked up for us, some stories, if you will, about words and how we use them. And um, well, the, the first one is, is, again, a throwback to our first week in the worthiness of words, because this story comes from the Don Miguel Ruiz book, The Four Agreements, and is kind of a description of how a poor, a misused word, a series of words, can have an impact for a negative impact for a whole life. So Don Miguel says there was a woman, for example, who was intelligent and had a very good heart. And I, I did leave out some of these, just to, some excerpts. So this is sort of summarized. But she had a daughter whom she adored and loved. And she came home from a very bad day to a daughter who was in a different place, singing and dancing and, and being full of joy. And angrily, she looked at her beautiful little girl and said, shut up, you have an ugly voice, can you just shut up? She didn't mean this. Um, the, the, these were totally just from her pain, from her terrible migraine, from her just, you know, the end of her rope at the end of a difficult day. So the little girl grew up, and even though she had a beautiful voice, she never sang again. She developed a whole complex from one spell and this spell was cast upon her by the person who loved her the most her own mother her mother didn't notice what she did with her word she didn't know the power of her word so therefore she isn't to blame and again this is we are never about casting blame we are only about information and retraining ourselves and finding the lessons and finding the gifts and choosing a new way so 
not knowing the power of her word and not being to blame, she did what her own mother, father, and others had done to her in many ways. They misused the words, the word. So, um, especially our little ones, they're listening. So the, the words that we say and especially the intent behind them is so very, very important. So we've all heard the phrase when we're little kids, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words would never hurt me. So wrong. Bruises heal, bones heal, little scratches from this kitty cat heal, but the scars made to our psyche, to our soul, to our heart can be there forever. Those can be wounds that never heal and that scar us forever. So we should really flip that around and say sticks and stones may hurt for a minute, but words can hurt forever. Um, so to, to add a little bit of lightness to the holiday season, there's an author that I really love by the name of Bill Bryson. And he loves to study up on things like words and how they how they started and how they evolved and how they were used. And he wrote a great book called The Mother Tongue, English and How It Got That Way. And so I want to read you an excerpt from that because it is, it, it's just an um, example of how things can get lost in translation, often to very humorous effect. So, consider this hearty announcement in a Yugoslavian hotel. The flattening of underwear with pleasure is the job of the chambermaid. Turn to her straight away. <laughs> or this warning to motorists in Tokyo. When a passenger of the foot heave in sight... Tootle the horn, trumpet at him melodiously at first, but if he still obstacles your passage, then tootle him with vigor. Are these instructions on a packet of convenience food in Italy? Besmear a backing pan, previously buttered with a good tomato sauce, and after, dispose the cannelloni, lightly distance between them in a only couch. <laughs> Uh, very funny. Clearly, the writer of that message was not about to let a little ignorance of English stand in the way of a good meal. In fact, it would appear that one of the beauties of the English language is that even with the most tenuous grasp, you can speak volumes if you show enough enthusiasm, a willingness to tootle with vigor, as it were. So, again, that's from the Mother Tongue, English and How It Got That Way by Bill Bryson. All right, so um, finally, I want to talk about the story of Thomas Edison. And, I, you know, I love the way that stories evolve and get embellished and get adapted to, you know, in, in oral storytelling and even in written storytelling to have a greater effect or to have a desired effect. And so I know that we've all heard the story of how Thomas Edison's mother, um, Thomas Edison brought home a note to his mother one day and um, she read it and told him that the, the letter said that her son was far too advanced to be taught in this school, that they weren't equipped to handle him, and that she should please school him at home. And the story goes that Edison later found this note in her in her things. Now, most the, the, like all stories, there's a root of truth, and I love to dig and get to the bottom of things. So the, the way this actually happened, and it is true that Thomas Edison received very little formal education because he, he didn't learn in the way that other kids did, and he had a mind that was going all kinds of places, and the formal education setting didn't suit him. But the way he told this in his own words was that one day I overheard the teacher tell the inspector that I was adult and it would not be worthwhile keeping me in school any longer. I was so hurt by this last straw that I burst out crying and went home and told my mother about it. Then I found out what a good thing a good mother is. She came out as my strong defender. Mother love was aroused. Mother pride wounded to the quick. She brought me back to the school and angrily told the teacher that he didn't know what he was talking about, that I had more brains than he himself, and a lot more talk like that. We can all picture an angry mama bear in this situation, right? In fact, she was the most enthusiastic champion a boy ever had, and I determined right then that I would be worthy of her and show her that her confidence was not misplaced. So this was Edison's first person account, and as you see, there's no letter to his mother involved in the events, and Edison was never kept out of the loop 
for sparing his already hurt feelings, but what he became one of the most prolific and ingenious inventors of all time, and he would be homeschooled until he set out on his own at the age of 16, but throughout his life he was openly grateful for his mother's support and education throughout his life, and he went on to be one of the great minds of our time to this day. And so, you know, the, the words that Thomas Edison's mother used to communicate with those authorities and to communicate to her son that you are worthy, you are smart, you are brilliant, you are genius, you can do anything that you set your mind to. These are the words, the magic white spells that we can cast and among our children, among all the children of the world, among all the people of the world. And watch how they can take that confidence, that support, and build it into things that will change our world in positive ways. So um, I love this topic. Be Pay attention to your words. Our assignment for this week is to begin to use the four-way test in the words that we speak. So had if we were to apply that um, test, to the story that's circulating around all over the place about the Thomas Edison and parting of the ways with formal education, you know, th that first, that we never would have heard that version of the story because it's not true. Um, it's based on someone's interpretation, the way says someone embellished that story. And while the, the basis of it is true, and, and again, th this is it okay? Is it okay to embellish a story in order to make it more effective? to make it better able to be communicated, to get your message across more strongly? You know, that that's a question to ask for yourself. But in this instance, if we're going to be true to this four-way test, we would want to go back and say, well, wait a minute, where did this come from? Is this true? And the true story is just as good. The true story is just as as effective and as moving and as inspiring as the made up and embellished story. So which would you prefer? I'm, I'm the type that I always, I would always love the truth. I'm always going to come back to the truth. And then secondly, is it kind? There's no reason to spread um, unkind words through the world. No reason at all. We build with our words. We sow and we reap with our words and we get to choose whether we're going to sow seeds of kindness or we're going to sow seeds of criticism and derision that can scar and live with people for the rest of their lives. So, you know, make that choice. Is it true? Is it kind? Is it useful? Are you, are we, are we sharing information or sharing stories that lift one another up or are we just using words to fill the silence? Which brings us to the fourth question and is it does it improve upon the silence and so in the last show on Tuesday we talked about how I learned to appreciate what silence is and to just really sit and be in that both by myself and with others but another wonderful thing about silence is that when you are silent you become an amazing listener and when you are carrying your end of the conversational burden, maybe how you can best serve in that instance is to listen. You know, sometimes people have so much on their heart. This life is hard. This life puts us through a lot of challenges that, that add contrast and add, you know, the, the dark threads that are woven through the tapestry of our lives and sometimes we need to talk about these we need to that we need someone to just be there and to just listen and that's an another amazing use of silence because when your mouth is closed your ears can be twice as open and you can be of even greater service to the to the people that are you are interacting with than you can if your mouth is moving and your mind is moving. So learning to appreciate silence. You know, we, we've always, we've all been in a situation where there's, there just are not words to express our sorrow, our empathy, our sympathy for another person and something terrible that they're going through. And these are the times when we can say nothing. We can let our silence and let our presence and our just being there be what is needed for that person instead of 
coming up with empty words that are just to fill the silence. So use the four-way test in your life this week and let us know what effects you see and how this feels and how many times you start to say something and you decide against it because your words didn't pass the test. So We'll be back next week on Tuesday at 1130 Eastern Time, and we're going to get pretty specific about empowered words and disempowered words in next week's, in next week's um, shows. So that's what we're going to do then, and I really look forward to seeing you. Until then, remember that happiness is a choice.